I will be voting Labour on June the 8th for the good of my family and I hope you will too too. I am delighted to introduce the leader of the Labour Party and our next Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn. Can I say, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for coming here today. And thank you to Bradford University for giving us this space this morning and a lovely conversation with Professor Brian Cantor, the Vice Chancellor of the University. And I think this university is a great place, going great places. Thank you very much for giving us the space this morning. <clears throat> And thank you to everyone in Bradford and indeed all across Yorkshire over the campaigning over the last few days. What a fantastic welcome we've had. What fantastic support we've received. And so many people tell me so much about the hopes they have in our manifesto, in our plans, in all of us. We intend to deliver on those hopes and on these plans. And thank you to Brian, Mohammed, and Christian, Christine for what you just said and the bravery with which you spoke about your own problems and demons because I am determined that we will deal with, address, and confront the issues of the mental health crisis facing this country so people don't face it and suffer alone. Thank you for what you said this morning. I also want to say a big thank you to all those that contributed to our manifesto. Those in our teams, in the Labour Party head office, in my team, that put such amazing amounts of work into producing a very good manifesto in a very short space of time. Well done to all of them and thank you to all the different society groups, civil society organisations, so many others that sent in really good ideas to us which have helped to frame our thinking and frame our ideas and of course the members and affiliated trade unions of the Labour Party. And I also want to say thank you to the party's national executive for the huge work they put in on this and a very deep appreciation to all my colleagues who are here today in our shadow cabinet. They've put enormous amount of work into upholding their briefs, into getting a message across, into contributing to our manifesto. And if you look at our shadow cabinet, you see experience, you see diversity, you see age range, you see people whose life experience is rooted in real life experience who will never forget that when they're holding great offices of state to deliver for the people that put them there. Thank you very much to all of my colleagues in the shadow cabinet. And of course, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in Bradford to launch this manifesto for the many, not the few. Because Bradford University had a chancellor for a long time, and a great chancellor he was. He was Harold Wilson, a former Labour Prime Minister. <laughs> who, whilst not born in Bradford, saw the strength and the values of this fantastic city. And Harold, as Prime Minister, did so much to expand university education and make it accessible for all and his greatest legacy I believe is the open university and the access that gives to everybody to go into higher education if that's what they wish to do at any stage in their lives and so I think today we're setting out a manifesto 
to transform the 21st century in the same way that Harold Wilson in the 1960s sought to transform the 20th century. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. This uh, manifesto is a draft for a better future for our country. It's a blueprint of what Britain could be and a pledge of the difference a Labour government can and will make. Like thousands of other Labour Party members, I've been making the case to people across the country over the last few weeks. This is a manifesto for all generations. We're providing hope and genuine opportunity for everybody. I say to our children, whatever the postcode you were born in, we will make sure you have the same chance as every other child. And I have to say, as the days turn into weeks, as this campaign has continued, opinion is changing and it's moving towards Labour. And actually, there is no secret as to the reason for that. Because people want a country run for the benefit of the many, not the few. That's because for the last seven years, our people have lived through the opposite. A Britain for the rich and the elite and the vested interests. They've benefited from tax cuts, bumper salaries and millions have struggled at the same time. Whatever your age or situation, people are under pressure, struggling to make ends meet. Our manifesto is for you. Parents worrying about the prospects of their children and anxious about the growing needs of their elderly parents. Young people struggling to find a secure job and despairing of ever getting a home of their own. Children growing up in poverty. Students leaving college burdened with debt. Workers who have gone years without a real pay rise and stretching family budgets just to survive. Labour's mission over the next five years is to change all of that. Our manifesto sets out how, with a programme that is radical and responsible, a programme that will reverse our national priorities and put the interests of the many first. We will change our country while managing within our means and will lead us through Brexit while putting the preservation of jobs first. Let me highlight just a few of our key pledges. And believe it or not, you may have read them already. <laughs> if you're an assiduous reader of newspapers. We're ruling out rises in VAT and national insurance and on income tax for all but 5% of the highest earners. Labour will boost the wages of 5.7 million people earning less than the living wage to £10 an hour by 2020. <laughs> Labour will end the cuts in the National Health Service and deliver safe staffing levels and reduce waiting lists. <laughs> Labour will scrap tuition fees, lifting the debt And that will lift the debt cloud from hundreds of thousands of young people. Labour will move towards universal childcare, expanding free provision for two, three and four-year-olds in the next Parliament. Labour is guaranteeing the triple lock to protect pensioners' incomes.
and we will build over a million new homes, at least half of them for social rent. <laughs> Labour makes no apology for offering new protections to people at work, including ending the scandal of zero-hours contracts. And we make no apology for finding the resources to hire 10,000 new police officers and 3,000 new firefighters. And we will do the smaller things that can make a real difference, like ending hospital car parking charges or introducing four extra... four extra public holidays every year. But we in the Labour Party recognise that dealing with and solving these problems requires a thriving economy, one that gets our economy working again and rises to the challenges of Brexit on jobs and investment. For seven years, the Conservatives have been holding Britain back. Low investment, low wages, low growth. Labour will move Britain to forward with ambitious plans to unlock this country's potential. We will set up a national investment bank and regional development banks to finance growth and good jobs for all parts of the United Kingdom. through the funding of major capital projects. Labour will also invest in our young people through a national education service focused on childcare, schools and skills, giving them the capacity to make a productive contribution to tomorrow's economy. And Labour will take our railways back into public ownership and put passengers first. We will take back control of our country's water by bringing them into regional public ownership. And we will take a public stake in the energy sector to keep fuel prices down and ensure a balanced and green energy policy for the future. The Tories now want to scare us into accepting more of the same. Only Labour has a plan ambitious enough to unleash this country's potential. And only Labour has the plan to make Brexit work for ordinary people. We are clear there is now a choice. Labour Brexit that puts jobs first, or a Tory Brexit that will be geared towards the interests of the City of London and risk making Britain a low-wage tax haven. As we leave the EU, because that is what the people have voted for, only Labour will negotiate a deal that preserves jobs, access the single market and preserves rights and access, not plunge our country into a race to the bottom. All this is costed, as the documents accompanying our manifesto make very, very clear. Our revenue-raising plans ensure we can embark on this ambitious programme without jeopardising our national finances. 
we're asking the better off and the big corporations to pay a little bit more. And of course, to stop dodging their tax obligations in the first place. And in the longer term, we look to a faster rate of growth driven by increased private and public investment to keep our accounts in shape. This is a programme of hope. The Tory campaign, by contrast, is built on one word, fear. What would another five years of Conservative government mean for Britain? Just, just look back at the last seven. More children living in poverty. Fewer young people able to buy their first home. More people queuing at food banks. Fewer police on the beat. Fewer firefighters too. More people are in work, but they're not getting the pay or the hours to make ends meet. More young people in debt. Will the Tories change their spots? Don't bank on it. Their record says they won't. The Prime Minister will disagree, of course. So I say to her today, in the most polite and friendly way possible, <laughs> come out of hiding and let's have a debate. <laughs> Have a, let's have a polite, respectful debate on television so millions of people can make up their own minds about which party offers better hope for Britain. <laughs> let's, debate. let's debate our two manifestos. Have the discussion. I'm confident that once the people of this country get the chance to study the issues, look at the promises, they will decide that Britain has indeed been held back by the Conservative government. They have prevailed over the many for far too long. And that they will decide it's now time for Labour. Our country, our country will only work for the many, not the few, if opportunity is in the hands of the many. So our manifesto is a plan for everyone. Have a fair chance to get on in life, because our country will only succeed when everyone succeeds. This message is for everyone in this country, be they young, be they middle-aged, or be they old. We want that inclusive society that cares for all. And as I said at the start of my speech, we are determined that a child's future is not decided by the place of birth, that a child's future is not decided by the underfunding of their primary school, a child's future is not decided by the poverty of their community, a government that invests for all. A government with the vision to ensure that the brilliance and imagination of every child can be fulfilled during their lifetime. Our proposal is a government for the many, not the few. Our proposals are of hope for the many all over this country. And I'm very proud to present our manifesto for the many, not the few. Thank you very much.
So a rap so, so a rapturous reception as Jeremy Corbyn launches Labour's manifesto. He didn't hold up the separate document that Labour's produced uh, called Funding Britain's Future. Uh, and just on the tax measures, when he said uh, corporations and the better off uh, were being asked to pay a little bit more, uh, here are the figures from uh, Labour's own document. Uh, corporation tax, 19.4 billion increase. Income tax increases, 6.4 billion. Excessive pay levy, 1.3 billion. Offshore company property level, 1.6 billion. Tax avoidance programme, 6.5 billion. Extension of stamp duty, 5.6 billion. Now, Sarah Champion, uh, the MP and, uh, or the former MP and candidate in this election and the party's equality spokesman, is chairing uh, the press conference, which looks as if there's going to be questions from the press and from uh, supporters. Manifesto um, is wonderful to hear. I've been waiting for 30 years to hear something like this that I could believe in and fight for. The question, though, is we have a huge issue in our area, which is fracking. We're delighted to see it in the manifesto, and we'd love to hear you say it as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, gentleman behind you, please. The gentleman with the tie. Thanks very much. Uh, Andy Bell, Channel 5 News. Um, Mr Corbyn, I know you don't want to set a target for immigration. Right, sorry. That's more like it. Andy Bell, Channel 5 News. Jeremy Corbyn, I know you don't want to set a target number for immigration, but can you simply say if you think it would be good for the country if the immigration level was reduced, if immigration came down? And finally, uh, Laura... No, 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 please, please, let's have respect for everyone who wants to ask a question, including members of the media. By the way, I'm a member of the NUJ. Um, Lorna. Thank, thank you. Um, Laura Koonsberg, BBC News. Um, Mr Corbyn, to be crystal clear for our viewers, for good or for ill, you think it's time to pay for your ideas, to tax more, to spend more, and to borrow more. First of all, thank you very much. The manifesto is absolutely clear. We believe that fracking is very damaging to the environment, and therefore Barry Gardner has made the statements on that, and I'm sure you understand and accept them and the way that Barry has put them. And I thank Barry for the work that he's done on it. He's nodding in agreement, so it must be true. Uh, on the issue of immigration, there is immigration from all parts of the world. Those that have migrated to this country have made an immense, enormous and fantastic contribution to our society. Without those that have... <laughs> those nurses that came from Jamaica, those doctors that came from India, those specialists that come from Germany, those that work in all aspects of our National Health Service, Education Service, industry, transport and so much else, have helped to give us the living standards that we all have. And I think we should recognise our country owes them a great deal of debt and thanks for what they've done. <laughs> We've also made it clear that people should not be brought into this country to work in poor conditions, on low wages, deliberately to undercut people that are already here in work on agreed conditions. <laughs> and that the free movement that currently exists within the European Union, obviously at the time we leave the European Union, that free movement doesn't continue. We will negotiate a trade agreement with the European Union that will ensure tariff-free access to the European Union and future migration will be based on a fair migration policy, a fairness towards our economy and our needs of our people and an end to the undercutting and exploitation that goes with it. And I believe that a Home Office led by Diane Abbott will be fair and decent and reasonable in the way that it runs it. But bear in mind, if there hadn't been people coming here to work in our NHS, 
all of us would be in far worse health than we are at the present time. Let's remember that. And Laura, and Laura, thanks very much for your question, and thanks for the way you put it. What we're proposing here is a rebalancing our economy, a rebalancing so that there is proper levels of investment in infrastructure fairly across the whole of the UK, not totally in the London and the South East, but in every region of the country. And I think that is extremely important. And a national investment bank that will ensure that fairness is taken all the way through it. We will also be, yes, increasing wages through the living wage, a living wage of £10 an hour by 2020. That will actually lead to economic growth and higher spending within the economy. It will also lead to a slight reduction in, um, in work benefits because of higher wages, but it will also help to rebalance our society. And from a government that has um, borrowed more than every Labour government in history over the past seven years, we really don't need lectures. We really don't need lectures from the Tories, from the Tories on this. We're there to invest for the future and invest for the good of all and to ensure there is fairness across communities and across the regions of Britain. And you know what? Every other country in the world says, why does Britain invest so little and pay itself so little while it allows such grotesque levels of inequality to get worse? Let's turn it round and do it the other way. Thank you. Um, I've got a lady on the very back row, the gentleman who has the most splendid moustache I've ever seen, and uh, the gentleman on the front row, mine. second most lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any provisions, um, Scarlett over here, um, is there any provisions um, to basically fix the failing academies that we already have in our system for schools? Because my son is now 18, and he came out with no GCSEs because the schools failed him. Uh, Peter Lazenby, Morning Star newspaper. Can anything be done about the shockingly biased media? Yeah. Hi, Jeremy. One of the problems people face in society, I think, is economic isolation. You see the number of high street banks that are closing down. You think it would be a good idea if there was a, a network of banks on the high street, maybe utilising post offices to provide a bank for the people? Thank you very much. Um, Scarlett, thanks very much for your question. Um, we don't want to close schools. Indeed, we want to see there is proper investment in schools all across the country. And under Labour, head teachers won't be asked to take collections at the school gate in order to pay for teachers' salaries and teaching assistant salaries. We will ensure there is decent and fair funding of all schools across Britain, not what is happening now, which is funding per pupil is being cut in the vast majority of schools, and the schools are paying the price for that with oversized and supersized classes, overstretched teachers, and an insufficiency of teaching assistants and so many other staff within the school. We will ensure our schools are properly funded. Secondly, where the <laughs> where there are schools that are failing, then I believe, and I'm sure Angela would agree with me on this, there has to be a, an effective and strong local education authority that can step in to make sure that the schools are properly funded. Because we are not convinced of the idea that every school should be accountable only to the Department of Education. We want a much stronger local community and family of schools and education. So we would want to bring free schools and academies within that family of local education in a mutually supportive environment. Because at its best, 
at its best if one school recognises it's got a problem of achievement in, say, English or maths, then a school down the road might be doing very well in those areas. You learn from each other. But if you create competition between schools all the time, you reduce the ability to learn from each other. Our children need to grow up knowing that the whole community is working for them. To quote the African proverb, it takes a village to bring up a child, not just the parents immediately with them. And since you so kindly brought up the question of education, Tom Watson and I have just been discussing on our wonderful campaign bus coming here how exciting it's going to be when we introduce the pupil arts premium so that every child gets a chance to learn a musical instrument in school. Uh, Peter, thanks very much for your question. Um, you've noticed that some of the media are slightly biased against the Labour Party. This is sometimes said to be the case. Listen, um, we're very serious about ensuring there is freedom of information and a right to know in society. It was, after all, Labour who introduced the Freedom of Information Act. We also recognise that in many societies around the world, very brave journalists lose their lives or are assassinated because they've uncovered the truth about brutal regimes and abuses of human rights. Journalists and journalism and free journalism and free press are intrinsic to a democracy and a free society. I fully understand that. But it's also important to ensure there is responsible journalism, that there is a multiplicity of ownership, that there is a right of reply, and there isn't an abuse of monopoly power within it. And so we would develop Leveson, and Tom Watson is very clear on this, that we will protect the diversity of our free press, and we will ensure there is diversity of all of our media outlets in this country, so that everybody can take an informed opinion. And the point that uh, Tony Cairns raised at the end about economic isolation, John McDonnell has put forward a very clear view that a high street bank is actually something that's quite important. It's part of our community. If you think about it, there's too many small towns, even medium-sized towns, where the town centre has been hollowed out, where various shops go, the banks go, and you get to a whole process of decline, and you end up with a town centre that is payday loan shops, bookies, and fast food outlets, and very little else. It's quite complicated, but with intelligent planning and good support, you can end up with a much more vibrant and effective town centres all across the country. And so John's proposal is that banks shouldn't be allowed willy-nilly just to close all their branches and leave some towns with no bank whatsoever. There's also the question of the promotion of uh, other banks as well. Credit unions have grown a great deal in our society. I'm indeed a member of a credit union myself, so I think they're a great way of helping people financially manage and helping them to get credit if they need it and get loans if they need it. I think those things are very important. There is also the role of the post office in this as an alternative source of banking, and indeed it was the Labour government of Harold Wilson that introduced the gyro account system in those days. And so we'd be looking, in, alongside the question of public ownership of Royal Mail, of the role that the post office will play in assisting people to get good banking. And again, that means you've got to keep post offices on the high streets of all our towns and cities in Britain. Thank you. Um, the next three, I am just going to go to journalists to prove how unbiased they are. Uh, so I've got uh, Robert, I've got Sky, I've got Jack. Sorry, I'm going for Jack instead. <laughs> Who's first? Uh, Robert's first, please. Robert. Um, uh, hello. Hi, Robert. Uh, a couple of things. Most 
forecasters say that the main reason why the living standards of those on lower pay is set to fall over the next few years is because of the freeze on benefits. And I'm struck that you haven't promised to end the benefits freeze. Why didn't you choose to do that in your program? And secondly, you've set out plans to spend about £50 billion a year more and tax companies and the rich by around £50 billion a year more. You've also got an ambitious program of investment and an extension of public ownership to energy, the Royal Mail, water. How much do you intend to borrow additionally every year? Thank you. Yes, um, Faisal Islam Sky News. Mr. Corbyn. Oh, hi. hi um, so you've described the manifesto as radical. The Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies has said that this is the biggest involvement of a government in the state since the 1970s. At, at the last election, just two years ago, two million more voters felt that the Labour Party was too radical and insufficiently irresponsible. Why, outside of this hall, and the swing voters who will determine the election, why should they trust you to set their water rates, their gas bills, and their train fares? Thank you. Um, Jack. Thank you. Uh, Jack Blanchard from The Mirror. Um, Mr. Corbyn, when the manifesto leaked last week, a lot of these um, policies we put to an opinion poll and they proved to be wildly popular. A vast majority of them people really, really like, but what they didn't like was you as leader. Why do you think that is? Okay. Thanks for your question, Jack. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. It's not the cult of personality, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, Ro Robert, thanks very much for your, for your question. Uh, yes, increasing benefits is important, and clearly we're not going to freeze benefits. That is very clear. We're also looking at the perverse effects of the benefit cap on people and their housing accommodation, particularly in London and the centre of our big cities. You will be hearing more about that in the very near future. Secondly, um, on um, borrowing and investment, I've made it very clear that this government has borrowed because it hasn't invested and it's borrowed more and more because it's invested less and less and we end up with a process of almost managed economic decline relative to what we could achieve as a result of that and so we're going to make it very very clear that this will be a government that invests for the future in all parts of the country because we have a grossly imbalanced process where the vast majority of transport infrastructure investment goes to London and the South East and so one of our key key commitments is a crossrail for the north from Manchester across to Newcastle. Um, uh, Faisal and Jack, your, your questions are actually the mirror images of each other. Did you get together to um, decide who was going to ask which? No, it's alright, that's a joke, don't worry about it. Um, when people talk about the 1970s, uh, and our manifesto doing that. I, I simply say that the other major party contesting this election is really, really forward looking. They're going to bring back fox hunting and grammar schools. That sounds really 21st century, doesn't it? And so. Yes, I've made it very clear, and John McDonnell will set out this in, in great detail tomorrow. Every one of our commitments is costed and funded. All of our borrowing commitments are there, out there in the open of what we would do. And you say the manifesto was leaked last week. Yes, um, many people got an advanced copy of it. We're, well, they read it anyway. Um, and um, the opinion polls that have tested the... Uh, policies individually have found them all to be very, very popular indeed. I just say this, I am very, very proud to lead this party. I was elected by a very large number of members and supporters, ordinary people all over this country, in trade unions, Labour supporters, Labour Party members. And I'm very proud that we have a party that is diverse, that is inclusive, that is pluralistic. And this manifesto, this manifesto is a product 
of that process. I see leadership as not dictating, but leadership is also about listening. Listening to what people say, understanding the stress, the pressures and the tensions in their lives, and ensuring that our party's policies, our government's approach to things, reflects the reality of people's lives. I'm very proud to represent an inner city community in London, and I love the community, and I listen very carefully to what they all say, as I do on all the traveling around the country. The function of leadership is to understand the stresses that people face in their daily lives, the frustrations, the thwarted ambition, the anger that they face, and try to produce policies that make that different. Being strong and standing up doesn't necessarily mean shouting, dictating, and instructing. It's how you put your case. So, as you well know, I do not indulge in personal abuse. I think it's appalling, the abuse that's thrown at individual colleagues in the shadow cabinet, in, in the trade unions, the appalling abuse that's thrown around on the social media, and the very dark places it drives people into when that abuse takes place. So I want to set an example, an example that you don't indulge in that. You debate the issues that we all face and come to solutions that we can all collectively accept and be enthusiastic and excited by. And you know what? This is something that has brought more than half a million people into membership of our party because they're excited about what we can do together for the good of everybody else.